In part two of this video series, we're going to look at, again, the center of mass. But here we're going to analyze more complicated compound objects such as the human body. When you're analyzing a compound body, it's often easier to use the concept of center mass because the motion will either be simpler when you look at the center mass or it may be such that it explains something that you can't tell by counting up the individual parts, at least by doing it by hand. The key point is that the system acts as if all the mass is a single particle with its mass at this location called the center mass. So let me show you an example of how the center mass can be used to analyze a complicated object. Take a basketball player whose legs are bent behind him and he's trying to dunk the basketball. And he jumps up and his ability to climb and get hit to a certain height is dependent, of course, on his velocity at takeoff on the angle. So it takes some athletic ability to get the correct launch angle and he has to have a certain amount of initial velocity which depends upon his leg muscles and the speed at which he's running when he jumps. Now, what is the point that obeys Newton's laws? We know that a particle thrown through the air follows a parabolic path. and and I apologize that that doesn't look like a parabola, but it's the best I could do with Microsoft Word. So it follows a parabolic path. It's not the legs, it's not the head, it's not the ball, it's not the hands. The part of the body that follows the parabolic path is the center mass. So there's, if you would, like the class average. There are some scores here and some higher scores. The average score is this x, and it is following the parabola, and it is what is determined by the initial velocity and this angle. Now, right now, the key thing to know about basketball is it doesn't care about the center mass. It cares about the ball right up here. And right now, the ball is not able to clear the rim to go into the goal. But if the basketball player kicks out his feet, in essence, lowers these scores, if you would. Where in reality for us, he lowers the mass. This would appear to lower the class average. That is, the center of mass would move from maybe up here to some lower place a few inches below. But here's the thing. Because there is not a net external force other than gravity, and we've already accounted for gravity by the parabolic path, the center of mass cannot change in terms of its location with respect to the ground. It has to stay on the parabolic path. That means that if the center of mass goes down, since it has to stay on a parabola, it's not the mass point that goes down. The rest of the body has to go up. And that means that the, the basketball goes up. Another way of thinking is if you keep the class average the same and you lower some student scores, other student scores have to go up. And most importantly, in this case, that means the basketball has to go up. And now it's above the rim, and he can dunk. And that's how a person kicks their feet and dunks a basketball, is not due to the interaction of the air. You can't kick your feet fast enough to fly. So that's one example. High jumping, pole vaulting, there are many other examples where, in fact, the center of mass doesn't even clear the bar. But the athlete takes advantage of the concepts of center mass in order to be able to jump higher. Let me show you another example where the center mass can help in analyzing. You're given a uniform chain of length L and mass M and it's hanging off the table as shown here. And they say how much work would you have to do to raise the chain at constant speed onto the table? Well this work, lifting this chain up and putting some of it for instance on the table, so we're going to lift it like this. I'll draw it to the side now. Let's say we've lifted a amount X here. And then L minus X would be left off. As you pull some of the chain on the table, the table begins holding up the chain and the amount of force you need to apply is less. And all of the work goes into increasing gravitational potential energy. That is, you're moving at constant speed, the network has to be zero. But who's doing work? You're doing work, and gravity's doing work. So you're doing the negative of gravity's work. But the work of gravity is the change in potential, the negative of the change in potential. So a negative of a negative becomes a positive. Now, one way to work this problem, since it is a non-constant force problem, is to try to 
get a graph of the force versus the distance. And if you do that, you know initially you're lifting all of the weight, mg, and at the end when you get a distance L, you're lifting none of it because at that point all the chain is up and this thing should be a straight line and you could maybe figure out that the work is the area under the straight line and so the work would be equal to one half mg that's the height times the length is L so it's mg L over 2 and that's okay as long as this was as simple as what I made it out to be now I'm going to show you how to work it with the center of mass and not to have to do any of this type of logic to try to figure out how to get a graph with area to the curve. Here's the thing. We know that we just need to find the change in gravitational potential energy. The center of mass of this entire chain is right in the middle. So if I call that y equals zero, then to raise it up to here, that's y equal L over 2. And remember, the center mass is the place where it acts as if all the mass, the entire length of the chain, is replaced by a single ball. So the work is simply equal to that ball, whose force now we get to lift is the weight, mg, times the distance that you have to raise it. What do you have to raise it? L over 2. You get exactly the same answer, but there's no trying to determine areas of the curve or anything. Just find the center mass, figure out how much you lift it. This type of concept could be very useful if this thing is not uniform. If I can find the center mass, figure out where I put the ball, I can still do this approach even though I may not find it easy to do this approach over here. The center mass makes solving a complicated problem easier. Now, some other things about center mass that can be useful. You can break apart a complicated object that's uniform into pieces. So you can have a very complicated problem and instead of working some sort of weird problem, let's say like and figuring out where the center mass of that object is, you can break it into parts maybe where each one of these you can see what they are there there that's about there that's the center mass center mass center mass center mass and replace each one of these with a little ball and then sum it up as we did in the first video also if you have a hole if something's cut out you can treat that as a ball but a ball with negative mass let me show you an example of how engineers do things like that you have the following object that I can think of as being broken into a bunch of rectangles. This rectangle, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Or I could even group bigger pieces together as a single piece. I'm going to break them all up by the little bitty rectangles and find the center mass here. So I got to have a coordinate starting point. I'm going to make this place right here zero and that zero. So this would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 10, 20, 30. The center of mass, I would have one ball there. There's a ball that's in the center. There's the center of mass, 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 and center of mass. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight balls. The first one happens to be located at five centimeters, midway between zero and ten. Five centimeters times one, whatever the mass is, we'll call it one kilogram, doesn't really mass, one unit. And I've got one, two, three. I have three of them, so I'll put the number three. This one I have one and it's at 15 centimeters. The next one I have one, two, three at 25 centimeters. And last I have one at 35 centimeters. 
and divide by the number of rectangles and I said there's three six eight so the center mass is equal to 15 plus 15 is 30 plus 75 that's 105 plus 30 that'd be 140 over 8 which is 70 over 4 centimeters which is 35 centimeters over 2 which is 17.5 centimeters so the center mass along X is somewhere along a line right here and that totally makes sense because another way to work this was to do the whole H by itself and it would have been right here and then I had this one extra ball due to this one guy over here that slightly pulled it to the side now we can also do the Y part doing the same thing this time I have three going this way at five centimeters I have three going here at 15 centimeters and I have two balls going right here at 25 centimeters and that's over eight three times 15 is 15 plus three times 15, I'm sorry three times five is 15 three times 15 is 45 that's 60 60 and 50 is 110 over 8 it's 55 centimeters over 4 let's see 12 would be 48 3 would be 52 so that's 10 13 and 3 fourths So 13.75 centimeters. So if we go up here again, take our red pen. We're not in the middle here as we would be because this low score has pulled it down. So we're right below that. And so right here is the place if you wanted to balance this thing that you would balance it at it turns out that that's also the place you'd place a axis of rotation if you wanted the easiest way to spin this object so that's one of the reasons to learn center mass is to do rotations in the next chapter so complicated objects can be broken down into simpler sets of little balls like we did in the first video all right I just said you could balance this. One way that people find the center mass is they use gravity. If you hold an object to the side, let's say this object here, and you hold it at one point, because the center mass does not lie along this line, it lies over here, gravity will pull on that. And we're going to find out in a later chapter that that's going to create what's called a torque and the object's going to want to rotate. And it will rotate around until the center mass lies somewhere along the line going straight down to the ground. So somewhere along this line is the center mass. If you do that in several other places, then what you'll find if you mark the object is a series of lines that will eventually all intersect in one place. And that one place is the center mass. We also rotate, for instance, tires to find the center mass. This is called balancing. If it's not balanced, we add a little weight to make it balanced. All right, so we'll talk some more about center mass in the next video.